most disturbing picture is a French satirical commentary on the display in England in 1812 of a South African woman who was known as the hot and tot Venus. I will give you more details of her story at the end of this talk. But for now, let me simply say that she was the sensation of the salon set in both London and Paris for three or four years around 1810, and that she was frequently exhibited in a cage. That mode of display having the obvious implication that her fascination largely consisted in the fact that she was regarded by many of her viewers as an animal or as akin to animals and very different from Europeans. I might mention that at that time, her people, the so-called Khoisan or Bushman Hottentot peoples of Southern Africa, were in the conventional racist ordering of human beings, considered the lowest of the lowest. There's even a story, true, about a party of Dutch settlers who in the 19th century shot and ate a Bushman, thinking that he was the equivalent of the Malay orangutan, and that therefore as an animal it was perfectly all right. The tragedy of this is that the history of scientific views, for the most part, and until quite recently on the subject of race, has supported this social and political notion that human groups are separated by profound and innate inequalities in intellectual abilities and moral behaviors. And by groups, the doctrine has been applied to a wide variety of divisions among us, to races, to sexes, to social classes, for example. This claim of profound innate inequality has never been based on data, because there never has been any data worth much until very recently on the subject of the character and extent of differences among us. Of course, I need hardly say, because it's obvious that there's a powerful social reason why those in power wish to advance such arguments. After all, there's no better, in the sense of effective, I don't mean the sense of right, there's no better arguments for the maintenance of privileges of those in power than the claim that those without power are so deprived by their innate endowments and that they therefore are where they should be and that it can't change. The point is that science is inevitably socially embedded and this isn't bad. I might say as a practicing scientist, of course I believe, as we must, that there is an external truth out there. I also believe that science bumbles along fitfully towards knowledge of that external reality, but that it is socially embedded and inevitably so because it's done by human beings and not robots is to me both uh, good and necessary. The point is, however, with respect to the issue of race, that I love science. I do it. I've devoted my life to it. I love science, and I therefore hate to see it misused for social purposes that are also alien to me. And this is why I'm so deeply troubled and offended by the history of scientific views on race. Because I see that history as largely the story of a claim for deep and ineradicable divisions among us. And the whole point of this lecture is really based on a profound irony, because a wealth of new and exciting data show how false that premise of the depth of inequality and the innateness of inequality is. If anything, we're now beginning to realize that there is a profound equality among the different groups of us based on the history of our evolution. What happens in history makes sense. It can be explained. I'm not arguing that the world is a thoroughly capricious or random world. What happens in history makes sense and can be explained. But it needn't have unfolded as it did. The world is not random, but history is massively contingent. And by that somewhat technical term, I mean that the events of history are so dependent on thousands of others that preceded it, each one of which need not have happened in the manner in which it did, that the current state of things, though it makes sense what you know what came before, is massively improbable, though sensible, in that special sense that it could have happened if you could replay the tape of life, 
in a hundred thousand other equally plausible ways. Now, I think that notion of contingency, the possibility of multiple pathways of history, is a theme that literature understands a lot better than science, or at least is depicted. It's the old story of the kingdom lost for want of a horseshoe nail, right? It's Marty McFly trying to reunite his prospective parents and back to the future because he knows that if he can't do it, and his ability to do it is contingent upon tiny little events that have to go in just the right way because there will be a cascade of consequences if he fails and even these tiny little events, that cascade leading to his own eradication, of course. And so it is with human equality. Human equality is a contingent fact of history. That is, human evolution might have unfolded or happened in a thousand other ways that would have been perfectly sensible. And each of those other ways might have left us with a variety of human groups profoundly unequal with respect to their intellectual capabilities and moral achievements. But it just didn't happen that way. It could have happened that way, it just plain didn't. Now let me, before I go into the body of this talk, emphasize the strictly limited nature of the point I'm trying to make. I am using the word equality in my title, in the factual sense of that term. That is not, as you well know, its more frequent meaning. I am emphatically not discussing equality as a moral or ethical issue. That is, I am emphatically not discussing the absolute right of each human being to equality of treatment and opportunity. This to me is inviolable, and it's not related at all to biological differences or to our biological status. In the ethical or moral sense, the most profoundly deformed stillborn fetus, the most profoundly retarded adult, incontinent and incapable of speech is absolutely and inviolably as fully human as Darwin or Einstein. Let me then move to the first subject of morphological differences among human races, namely how separate and how ineluctable and deep is that separation among human races. My first stage will be before 1859. 1859 is, of course, a watershed, because that's the year of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. So when we look at the debate on human racial differences before 1859, we're looking at the pre-evolutionary context. Now, the biggest argument, at least in American and most of European anthropology in the years before Darwin, about the meaning of racial differences centered on a debate between two schools, one group called the monogenists, meaning single source, monogeny, who believed that all human beings are descendants of a single primal pair, the Adam and Eve mentioned in the Bible, and the polygenists who held that the story of the Bible is only the story of the history of white folks and that the various major human races are actually separate species with absolutely separate created origins. However, I think we can all acknowledge that in the logic of polygeny, that is the claim that races are truly separate species, is the str absolutely strongest potential argument for the ineradicable, primal, deep differences among... You can't make a stronger argument than the claim that races are actually separate species with separately created origins. So I take polygeny as the strongest form of that claim for profound inequalities based on an ineluctable biology. Let me just give you a couple of examples, and I'll show you some slides from that era, to show you how popular a view it was, and not among marginal people. This is David Hume, who we all revere for his analysis of causality, among other things, who wrote in 1766, I am apt to suspect the Negroes, and in general all the other species of men, for there are four or five different kinds, to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation. No ingenious manufacturers amongst them, no arts, no sciences. Such a uniform and consistent difference could not happen in so many countries and ages if nature had not made an original distinction betwixt these breeds of men. Let me show a few slides from the days of Polygeny. This is 1799. 
Charles White's regular gradation in man, it's the last attempt I know of in the English literature to depict all of the animal creation, as White would have called it, as a single ascending linear series, according to the old view of the chain of being. Now, of course, it's a remarkably motley and heterogeneous assemblage that White gives us here, beginning in the lower left corner with a snipe, going to a crocodile, to a greyhound, up to monkeys, and then in the top row, up the conventional racist ladder of human beings, from blacks to yellows to whites. The next is not from a racist tract, but from the standard American textbook in anthropology of the mid-19th century, Knott and Glidden's Types of Mankind. It represents the kind of egregious data selection that is clearly done in order to reinforce a viewpoint of the similarity of the so-called lower races with monkeys and apes. Another one in the same tradition and from the same book which can pass without further commentary. Now here's a more subtle and interesting story, <clears throat> and there are many like this. The most famous study done under the aegis of a belief in polygeny was performed in Philadelphia by a physician named Samuel George Morton, who in the 1830s made the world's largest collection of skulls of different races of human beings and published his account of the differences in cranial capacity in his Crania Americana of 1839. I'm going to show you two slides from the Crania Americana. The lithographs done by John Collins, uh, beautiful works of art representing some of the very best of 19th century American scientific illustration, but they also show how illustration can be subtly used in the service of unconscious prejudice. Morton in this figure shows us the skull of an Arakanian Indian and he's trying throughout to emphasize that Indians have smaller cranial capacities than whites. The way in which the skull is depicted there, it does seem to slope backwards and to be, if you will, low-browed and therefore not well endowed. That's where the terms high-brow and low-brow come from. They're old terms from 19th century craniometry. However, Morton here has oriented the skull in a completely unconventional way. An old convention in these depictions dictates that the horizontal axis shall be on what was later called the Frankfurt horizontal, that is the line between the ear hole and the tip of the nose. Now this skull is not oriented along the Frankfurt horizontal, the horizontal goes down like that, therefore the skull tilts back and seems to be low-browed. Now, you might say, well, maybe Morton didn't follow that convention. Maybe he put all his skulls that way, but no. Look how he orients the skull of a superior Swiss white man right on the Frankfurt horizontal with the apparently more vaulted and better endowed cranium resulting from it. All right, that's stage one. Let's go to stage two, then. With the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859, of course and immediately, the old debate between monogeny and polygeny became irrelevant. With the triumph of Darwinian evolution, everyone had to admit that all human beings must be able to trace their ultimate ancestry back to a single point of origin. That's implicit in the very evolutionary argument. Now, you might think superficially that therefore evolution would have been a powerful and necessary blow towards the acceptance of equality among human races. But it wasn't, you see, because although it is a retreat from the hard argument of polygeny in some logical sense, there is, in the evolutionary view, another interpretation which, although it admits a common origin, is more congenial with respect to its view about the nature of racial differences with the old notion of ineradicable innateness. That is, you can say, yes, indeed, of course I admit it, evolution requires it, that <clears throat> all human races have a common point of origin. But, you then argue, that point of origin was so long ago that human races have been so separate for so long, <clears throat> that substantial genetic differences translating to inequalities have evolved and are now so fixed in the various races that for all it means in terms of the possibility of ever eradicating those differences, you might as well say they're original. This is from Ernst Haeckel's 1874 Anthropogeny of the Evolution of Man. It's not meant to be subtle and it's not. Here. Heckel showing the kinship of humans, but he chooses a black man with apes, 
Not only has his black man sitting on the limb of a tree, but even on a limb below that where others of the great apes are perched. Now here's an interesting example meant to show the ramifications of scientific racism. In the 19th century there arose, originally in Italy but spreading throughout the world, an important movement within the study of criminal behavior begun by an Italian named Lombroso in 1876, published his book, L'Uomo Delinquente, Criminal Man. Lombroso argued that a large percentage, not all, of criminal acts occurred as the result of the innately, biologically criminal nature of offenders, and that you could tell who the biologically tainted offenders were by atavistic signs of apish morphology preserved in the offenders. In other words, criminals were individual human beings who unfortunately did not progress far as most of us along the scale of evolution. And that was a very powerful movement, which obviously added social utility in arguing that crime is not to be ascribed to social inequalities, but to an ineluctable sort of biology. In any event, this is the frontispiece to Lombroso's Roma Delinquente, in which we see the physiognomy of various innately criminal people. Okay, I then move to the second theme, namely the discussion of geography, or where did humans evolve. It's a much shorter story, but it's an interesting one, because it reinforces the same theme. It has to do with the long effort in a sense still continuing, to deny what now seems to be factually so, namely that the source of human origin is indeed in Africa. This desire to deny it largely being motivated by a wish to see the black people of Africa as a secondary migration and degeneration of a human stock in Africa with the origin of humanity in Asia in the Indian or Central Asian cradle of the Aryan peoples. So it's the old Aryan myth, if you will. I think you know <clears throat> that when Dart discovered the Australopithecines in the 1920s in Africa, they were not accepted, the creatures that we now all accept as ancestral to us, they were regarded as an odd side branch of apes that walked direct. It wasn't until the 1950s when overwhelming evidence of more and more of these things and anatomical analyses essentially forced us to acknowledge their prototypically human characteristics. The main reason for the denial was that most scientists firmly believed in the theory of Asian origins. All right, that's stage one, the desire to see it all beginning in Asia. There's a stage two, just as there was for morphology, where you admit, okay, the Australopithecine evidence is overwhelming. There's no way I can get around that. That's correct. Therefore, we must allow that the initial origin of humanity is in Africa. However, you can still salvage the Asian theory in the following way. You say, all right, it all started in Africa, but we were pretty primitive then. When you get to the level of Homo erectus, Homo erectus spreads out into Asia, Homo erectus is the ancestor of intelligent human life. Homo erectus is an Asian species. So although we might have split from the chimpanzee lineage in Africa, as Homo erectus, we evolved intelligence in Asia. That's stage two. Problem is, that doesn't work very well either. Guess why? Because Homo erectus has now been found in Africa as well. And the oldest Homo erectuses are in Africa. So it looks as though Homo erectus also evolved in Africa and then spread out so that the Java and Peking populations are the descendants of African migrants. You can still save, and some people have tried and still are trying, you can still save the Asian theory by saying, all right, I have to admit that too. Homo erectus evolved in Africa, that's true, but at least Homo sapiens, our own species, Homo sapiens evolved in Asia or Europe, right? Well, that issue is unresolved. But based on evidence I'm going to present in a moment, it begins to look more and more as though Homo sapiens also evolved in Africa, that all human species evolved in Africa, that Homo erectus may have spread out into Asia, but it's not those populations that gave rise to us, and we are all the descendants of a stock of Homo sapiens that emerged from Homo erectus in Africa, like every other species. All right, I will rapidly move into the next part of the talk, which is on 
the reasons for my biological claim that human equality is a contingent fact of history. Now, the paleontological evidence combined with the genetic evidence is getting clearer and clearer. First of all, the whole human lineage is very young. I don't mean just the division of Homo sapiens into races. The whole story of the Australopithecines and Homo erectus and anything that came after, because the best biochemical dates and the more we understand about the fossil record seems to be falling into line, indicates that the split of the human from the chimp lineage occurred in Africa probably no more than six to seven million years ago. And that's not a whole lot of time for everything. So the whole human lineage is young. But that's not really the subject of this talk. This talk is about the much later division of our modern species, Homo sapiens, into races. Now remember, all the old arguments claim, and there's no other way to support a claim for racial inequalities, that the species pardon me, that the racial divisions within Homo sapiens are very ancient and may go back as far as the level of our ancestral species, Homo erectus. But there's now substantial evidence indicating that that is not so, that the origin of Homo sapiens was a specific historical event in Africa that occurred within the last hundred to two hundred thousand years, which is a geological yesterday, but the whole story of the migration of Homo erectus into Asia, probably the whole story of the migration of Neanderthal man into Europe, has nothing to do with our ancestry, that these are lineages that died out without issue, and that we are the product of a very recent event of speciation in Africa through the origin of Homo sapiens. And that brings me then to the centerpiece. Uh, what I'm reporting on now is an article by Can, Stone King, and Alan Wilson that appeared in the British journal Nature about seven or eight months ago. What uh, Can, Stone King, and Wilson did is as follows. They work with mitochondrial DNA. And there's a very good reason for doing that. I think probably most of you know that the mitochondria of your cells, that is the energy factories within your cells, have a certain amount of genetic material associated with them, as they have their own genomes. Now, there are two reasons why you use mitochondrial DNA and why only mitochondrial DNA could really resolve the issue of the topology of branching on the human tree. Uh, the first reason is that mitochondrial DNA has an extremely simple pattern of inheritance. That is, sperm contain no mitochondria, or no mitochondria that get it and fertilize the egg. Uh, what of a sperm enters an egg cell is only the nucleus. It's only the nuclear genes. Therefore, all your mitochondria you got from your mother. The second and more important reason for using mitochondrial DNA to resolve this issue is that for reasons we don't fully understand, but that seems well documented, mitochondrial DNA evolves much faster, on average, than nuclear DNA, about 10 times as fast. And the division of Homo sapiens into races has been so recent that if we use nuclear DNA with its average slow rates of evolution, not enough change would have accumulated even to be able to measure the differences. So we have to use the mitochondrial DNA. Now, they got a sample of 147 people. Not nearly enough. This is very preliminary. We'll know more. It'll be better resolved in a few years. But these 147 people included all major racial groups. They got whites. They got orientals. They got various groups of Africans, they got people from Australia and New Guinea, and they compared the mitochondrial DNA sequence of these 147 human beings. They then constructed the evolutionary tree of branching based on mitochondrial similarities following the obvious assumption that the greater the difference in mitochondrial sequence, the longer the time of separation of the groups represented by those particular people. The first conclusion they reach is that when you make the most probable tree of human evolution from the mitochondrial differences, that tree has a stunningly simple topology. Basically, there are two branches, okay? And they unite at some point. One branch includes only people from Africa. The other branch includes 
other people from Africa, plus absolutely everybody else. And then the two branches join. Now the only conclusion you can draw, if that is the correct apology, is that all humans evolved initially in Africa. And then one lineage splitting in Africa yielded all the migrants that went out and colonized the rest of the world. Now that's only half the story because I think many of you will appreciate and will have already appreciated that that in itself doesn't give you anything. Because we've admitted for a long time that humans evolved in Africa. I haven't told you anything about time. We have to know when those two branches come together in Africa. Maybe it was two million years ago. If it happened two million years ago, that's back at the level of Australopithecines. Maybe it was one million years ago, which means that it happened at the level of Homo erectus. So maybe our racial differences are deep. That only proves the African origin. It doesn't say anything about the timing. To make the inference about timing, you have to make another assumption. And this assumption is admittedly more tenuous. You assume that mitochondrial DNA changes at a constant average rate and that that average rate can be specified because there is now in the literature a wide variety of studies when we do have good paleontological evidence for the actual timings of branching events, all of which are consistent with the postulate that in widely differing lineages, on average, mitochondrial DNA evolves at the same rate, and we know what that rate is. Now, if the assumption holds that that measured average rate across many different lineages of mitochondrial DNA also is true for human beings, then the following really stunning conclusion emerges from this study. Namely, that the two branches of the tree, one containing all Africans, one containing other Africans plus everybody else, join in Africa somewhere between about 150 and 250,000 years ago. But the branch that then is responsible for all non-African racial variation divides within itself somewhere between 90 and I think 180,000 years ago. So that the origin of all racial diversity involved in this argument about inequality, namely differences between blacks, whites, and yellows, is all a product of the last 100,000 years or so. It's not the millions of the Australopithecines. It's not the hundreds of thousands of Homo erectus. It's that tiny little geological microsecond of the last 100,000 years at most if these data are correct and if the assumption of constant rates holds. And that just simply, and this is the so-called bottom line of the whole talk, that simply is just not enough time for much in the way of substantial differences to evolve. And that is affirmed in the direct evidence. In short, the conclusion is simply this, colon, there's astonishingly little genetic difference among us. No one has ever, for example, discovered what you might call a race gene. That is a state of the gene present in all members of one race and none of another. There are many differences in gene frequencies, to be sure. Blood groups differ, skin color differs, as you know. But almost all the variation is within coherent groups. Very little is added by putting new groups into the sample. In fact, about 80% of the variation in Homo sapiens is within coherent groups. That's how little, on average, we differ one from the other as a result of the high degree of variation within each group. Now let me reiterate, before I get into my epilogue, what I said at the very beginning. Why is it that human equality is a contingent fact of history? Because the split was recent among our races and there has not been time for the development of much separation. But I remind you, it need not have been. One can develop, because history is so massively contingent, a hundred other scenarios. I remind you that the robust Australopithecines might have survived. What if they had? As I said earlier, we would have been confronted with a species of human-like beings probably capable of a fair number of deep human characteristics and behaviors, but decidedly inferior in mentality. What would we have done? A whole variety of solutions suggest themselves, from genocide to slavery to zoos 
the concentration camps, even to kindness, I don't know. But it would have been a very different world. Or what would we have done if the races were ancient and had developed substantial genetic separations that might have translated into true inequalities? We would have a world with very different moral dilemmas. Human equality is a contingent fact of history. I now move into the epilogue. So far I've been discussing generalities, but what really matters, you know, is how the practice of science affects people, how it affects individual human lives. We only live once, we only get to go through this world once, so far as we know, and if our lives are thwarted, if our hopes are derailed, if our dreams are made impossible by a set of limitations imposed actually from without, but falsely identified as residing within us, then in a way that's the greatest tragedy that one can imagine. And millions, hundreds of millions of human lives have been so blighted by those assumptions of the impossibility of achievement due to innate and ineradicable inferiority either of sex or of race. And that to me is one of the great tragedies of human history. So I want to end by emphasizing that point that what really matters is how it affects people, individuals. So I want to end by telling you the story of two women who are separated by a world, by a century. One was a South African woman, the Hottentot Venus, who lived in the early 19th century. The other, an American, who lived a hundred years later. Both were exploited in the name of the ideology of deep difference, an ideology invented to preserve social stability, or in the name of purifying a race. Let me then go back to the tale of the Hottentot Venus, and I must say something about her story to realize the extent of that exploitation. Why the Hottentot Venus? Why did she have that name? She was a house servant in South Africa. She was brought to Europe. She was exhibited often in a cage for several years in London and Paris from about 1810 to 1815. Why? What was this all about? Why her? And the answer arises from both aspects of her name, the Hottentot Venus. The Hottentot because she was considered fascinating as the lowest of the low, and therefore had a special fascination in the racist ordering. But she wasn't the Hottentot woman. She wasn't the Hottentot person. She was the Hottentot Venus. Why the Hottentot Venus? What? was the sexual part of the theme that really explains that fascination. And that's where the true nature of the exploitation, I think, is most clearly seen. By the way, she had a name. Her name was Saki Bartman, but she was known as the Hottentot Venus. And, as I said, Venus, the fascination was largely sexual due to two features of her anatomy. And that's, what's, that's why I show you this slide, because for all its ugliness, that's what's being shown here. First of all, Khoisan women accumulate large deposits of fat in their buttocks, a condition known as steatopigia. And clearly that's what this slide is largely showing. The English beef eater on the left, because it's a French lithograph, is saying, oh god them, quel roast beef, as he looks at uh, the steatopigia of the Hottentot Venus. But that's not the center of the story. And to realize the full depth of the exploitation, you have to know a little bit more about the history of anthropology. And it's also in this slide. The slide is called Les Curieux en Extase, the curious in ecstasy, ou les cordes de soulier, or the shoelaces. Now why the shoelaces? Because they had long circulated through scientific and lay circles in Europe a curious story that the Hottentot women alone among human beings possessed a curiously elaborated sexual feature which was called the Sinus Pudoris, or the Curtain of Shame, the Curtain of Modesty. But Sarki Bartman would never display her Sinus Pudoris, also called the Hottentot Veil or the Hottentot Apron, because under the customs and traditions of her people, she could not do so. And that's what this is about, you see. That's why it's the curious in ecstasy, or the shoelaces. The woman is on her knees pretending to tie her shoes. 
but she's really trying to get a peek up Saki's skirt at this great legend of the Cenus Pedorus. Meanwhile, the dog at the right is very pointedly showing us that we are all very much the same under our different clothings. <laughs> now, what about Saki Bartman? Maybe it wasn't such a tragedy. After all, she was brought to Europe. She was promised half the profits. She was promised that she could go back a wealthy woman. But you know, it never happened. She was displayed, displayed once again, and over-displayed. She died in Europe, ended up on the dissecting table of Georges Cuvier, the greatest anatomist of Europe, where, indeed, Cuvier was able to establish that the Cenus pedoris wore the enlarged labia minora of the female genitalia. So that's the story of the Hottentot Venus. Lastly, the story of Doris Buck, an American, lived a hundred years later than the Hottentot Venus. As you probably know, in the United States, in the 1920s, something like 30 states passed laws for forced eugenical sterilization of various people judged by the state to be mentally defective. Admittedly, these laws were rarely enforced, and there were not large numbers of eugenical sterilizations performed in America. Although the laws were enforced strictly in the states of Virginia and California, and something on the order of, I think, 40 to 50,000 people were sterilized. However, the American laws became the model for the German forced sterilization laws, which were stringently enforced, and led to the sterilization of apparently three to 400,000 people in Germany, the forced involuntary sterilization, including people whose only crime was to be blind or deaf in a manner judged to be heritable. The eugenical sterilization laws of America were upheld in a famous Supreme Court decision in 1927 called Buck versus Bell, written by the famous and aged Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a chilling and famous line in his decision. He wrote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. What were the three generations of imbeciles of Holmes's famous remark? The case involved a woman named Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was the illegitimate daughter of a woman named Emma Buck, and Carrie had herself just given birth to an illegitimate daughter named Vivian. We know very little about Emma, although it was claimed that she was mentally defective, Carrie was judged, though never really tested, to be mentally defective. To be an imbecile, imbecile is a technical term for mental retardation at a level where people can write. Idiots are mentally retarded people who do not have language. I mean, Holmes knew what he was talking about. He, he really meant it. It wasn't metaphor. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And it was also reported that Carrie's daughter, Vivian, was similarly afflicted. And therefore, three generations of illegitimate, retarded humans had been born, and the sterilization was justified, Oliver Wendell Holmes decreed. Now, that case got buried. Nobody thought much about it. But in 1980, an investigative reporter tracked down Carrie Buck, who's still alive, living near Charlottesville. She has died since. She died two years ago. Many reporters and scientists and others visited Carrie Buck during the last years of her life. She was a perfectly ordinary woman of obviously normal intelligence. There's no sign in the world that she suffered any mental retardation. That's not what the case was about. The case was about presumed sexual immorality. It was about Carrie Buck's illegitimate daughter. She had, in fact, had been raped and made pregnant by the relative of the people with whom, a relative of the people with whom she'd been living. I was always curious about Vivian Buck, her daughter, because Vivian died at age eight. And it occurred to me the only way to figure out what the presumed mental status of a child who died so young was, would be to discover her school records. And after many years, thanks to the help of a friend, Paul Lombardo, I was able to find Vivian Buck's school records, her report cards. And she was a perfectly ordinary child of not outstanding, but absolutely average mental accomplishment. She did not outstandingly, but perfectly adequately in all her schoolwork. In other words, for what it is worth, though it's a small footnote in a correction to history, there was not a single imbecile, so far as any evidence can tell us, among the three generations of Bucks. But my story concerns Doris Buck, Carrie's sister. Because when Carrie was discovered, in the early 1980s. Her sister Doris was also found and interviewed. Now, turns out 
that her sister Doris had also been sterilized under the same law, though she had committed no crime. She was brought into the hospital for what she was told would be an appendectomy and was, in fact, sterilized through the severing of her fallopian tubes. She was never told. She never knew until these hospital records were unearthed in the late 1970s or early 80s. And for what it's worth, Doris Buck's lifelong wish was to bear a child, was to be a mother. She married a plumber named Matthew Figgins. They tried throughout her childbearing years to conceive. They visited doctors in various cities, hoping to find the cause of her infertility. But she didn't know her fallopian tubes had been severed. That's not discovered on routine examination. She never knew for all those years the cause of her lifelong sadness. I'd like to end this talk if I may, by quoting myself, it's the end of The Mismeasure of Man, so you'll know you've got to the end when you get to this passage. <laughs> now, one might invoke an unfeeling calculus and say that Doris Buck's disappointment ranks as nothing compared with millions dead in wars to support the designs of madmen or the conceits of rulers. But can one measure the pain of a single dream unfulfilled, the hope of a defenseless woman snatched by public power in the name of ideology, advanced to purify a race. So may Doris Buck's simple and eloquent testimony stand for millions of deaths and disappointments and help us to remember that the Sabbath was indeed made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Doris Buck said, I broke down and cried. My husband and me wanted children desperately. We were crazy about them. I never knew what they'd done to me. Thank you.